Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 5.10, which is urbanization. So urbanization is just the act of converting natural landscapes, such as forests or wetlands, into urban landscapes, which are cities or towns. So today we'll discuss the environmental issues that occur with urbanization. We'll talk about some of the causes and why it's expanding in the United States and many developed nations. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the solutions. So our objective for the day is to be able to describe the environmental effects of urbanization. We'll talk about how it can lead to something called saltwater intrusion and how it can lead to increased fossil fuel combustion and therefore CO2 emission into the atmosphere. We'll discuss how urbanization replaces pervious land with impervious land. That means land that does not allow water to infiltrate into the ground. And then finally, we'll discuss why urban sprawl is occurring. And that's this process of population distribution heading from dense cities out to less dense suburbs. Our suggested science skill for the day is describing a disadvantage or a drawback with a potential solution for a problem. So the first thing to know about urbanization is that it is the removal of vegetation and natural landscape and the conversion of that natural landscape to an urban landscape. So one of the problems here is that this replaces the soil, the vegetation, so it could replace valuable ecosystems like wetlands or forests, and it's going to replace them with impervious surface. Now, impervious surface would include things like concrete and asphalt that you'd find on sidewalks and roads and buildings. And impervious means that it does not allow water to infiltrate. So water can't seep through the concrete into the ground beneath it. It has to leave as runoff. So if we look at this diagram here, we'll see there's a substantial difference in the amount of runoff we produce in a city, in an urban landscape versus in a natural landscape. In a natural landscape, as much as 50% of the rainwater is going to either infiltrate the ground through shallow infiltration or through deep infiltration, but in the city, that's 15%. And so the vast majority of that's going to be leaving its runoff, and then we're going to get some evaporation as well. So this disturbs the natural water cycle by limiting groundwater recharge in cities and leading to lots and lots of what we call urban runoff or stormwater runoff. We'll be discussing the impacts of that and solutions to it in another video. Another big impact is CO2 emissions. So because we are producing cement and asphalt to actually build the city, that process releases CO2. We're also going to use a lot of machinery for construction. Remember those machines run on fossil fuels, so that emits CO2. We have deforestation because we need to clear land for the city. So that's going to be the loss of future carbon sequestration. Those trees can't store carbon anymore after they're cut down. And their decomposition after they're cut contributes even more CO2 to the atmosphere. And then finally, as urban populations continue to grow, more people produce more waste. And so we need to dig more landfills into the ground. And the products that we put into the landfill result in even more carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere and methane, which remember is 24 times as warming as carbon dioxide. Another environmental issue caused by urbanization is something called saltwater intrusion. So as many of the world's largest cities are located near the ocean, we have a lot of population growth in coastal cities. So the problem is that as the populations in these coastal cities grow, they're forced to draw more and more water out of their groundwater resources. What this does is lowers the water table and it decreases the amount of pressure that the groundwater has to exert back on the seawater. So if we look at this diagram, under normal circumstances, the fresh water is at a higher level. The water table is higher than seawater, and so it exerts this kind of downward pressure that keeps the seawater from infiltrating in. When we have excessive consumption, the water table is going to be dropped, the pressure in the groundwater is decreased, and the salt water is able to seep into the groundwater, and that's going to contaminate this groundwater source that people are using as fresh drinking water. We have another scenario here where sea level rise can cause the same thing to occur. So due to the warming of the atmosphere, that causes the oceans to warm, and something called thermal expansion occurs. Thermal expansion is when the ocean level rises just because the molecules of water in the ocean get a tiny bit further apart, and so that can raise sea level. Another issue that can raise sea level is the melting of polar ice caps. And because these melt, they add water to the ocean. That just increases its volume, so it increases sea level. So we can see here in the diagram, as sea level starts to rise, that salt water is able to overcome the pressure of the groundwater, and it seeps into the fresh groundwater source, and now it's contaminated with salt water. So again, as urbanization continues closer to the coast, as we have population growth in urban cities that are near the coast, we're going to start to experience saltwater intrusion, and that contaminates the fresh groundwater so it's no longer able to be used for drinking or for irrigation for agriculture.
So now we'll talk about some trends in population movement. So we can see in this graph here that from 1950 to 2000, we have a dramatic shift from rural communities to urban communities, and especially to suburban communities. We'll talk about what that means and why it's happening. One of the main causes is that people move from rural communities into urban areas for increased job opportunities, for things like entertainment or cultural attractions. So there are often sports teams, there's big music venues. There's just a lot going on in these dense urban areas that attract people to move there. This can actually decrease people's individual environmental impact. And that's because urban areas are more densely populated. So they're more walkable. It's easier to get around without driving as much. Typically, homes are going to be smaller in these densely packed urban areas. And so on a per person basis, environmental impact can actually be minimized by living in more densely populated areas. What we should note, especially looking at this graph, is that the highest growth currently is in the suburban population. And those are less densely packed areas that surround urban areas. So this shift in population from these dense urban areas out to the suburbs creates an issue called urban sprawl. So again, this is the movement now away from the densely packed urban areas out to the less dense suburbs that surround them. So again, examples of suburbs of Grand Rapids would be Kentwood, Wyoming, Forest Hills. These are all less dense communities that surround the dense urban area. So we'll talk about the causes for this. One of the main causes is there's cheaper property values. So you can buy a larger piece of land and a larger home for the same price in a suburb compared to in this densely packed city. And that's because the demand for property is so much higher in these cities. Another issue is the affordability of cars and gasoline. So they make it really easy to live out in the suburbs, but still commute into the city for things like work or entertainment. And then we get something called the domino effect. So as you start to see your neighbors leave densely packed urban areas, you're more likely to leave as well. And this leads to a positive feedback loop where there are fewer residents in the city. And so the tax base of the city declines. When residents move out of the city, they no longer pay taxes to the city. So the city's forced to cut services. They can't offer as many uh, police patrols. They can't offer as many bus routes. They can't maintain their public parks in the same way. And so what happens is more residents leave because they enjoyed these services and they're no longer available. Uh, this is going to leave businesses to start to move out into the suburbs as well because there's a lower uh, consumer base for them. There's fewer residents. And then finally, we get something called blight. So you can see here in the diagram, the neighborhood starts to decline because there are so many abandoned homes, so many abandoned buildings, and that just drives even more people to leave. We call this a positive feedback loop because as more people leave, the city budget declines even further. So services are cut even more and even more businesses will leave, which makes the blight even worse. So the problem, once it starts, becomes kind of a vicious cycle where it feeds into itself and makes the urban sprawl even worse. So now we'll talk about the role that highways and the gasoline tax play in this as well. So as we expand the highway system, it makes it easier to drive and easier to live in the suburbs, but commute into the city. As more people drive, it increases our consumption of gasoline and there's a tax on gasoline. And this gasoline tax revenue is actually used to build more highways. And so as more highways are built, we have an easier time commuting. We drive even further. That fuels more gasoline tax revenue. And so we build even more highways. So we have another positive feedback loop when it comes to the gasoline tax and the building of highways causing more driving, causing more gasoline tax, and the cycle just continues and continues. So let's talk about some solutions of urban sprawl. One solution is something called an urban growth boundary. So this is a zoning law that a city can enact, which says beyond this point, there's just no more urbanization. We're not building this city further out than a given point. And this can kind of contain the sprawl of the city and force people to build vertically or to use old abandoned buildings that are already existing in the city, and it can force cities to be more efficient with their land use and limit sprawl. Efficient public transportation is another way to mitigate or reduce urban sprawl. If people have an effective bus system that's clean and on time and affordable, they're more likely to stay because they can decrease their costs for driving. If the city's really walkable and they can easy, easily get around, they're more likely to stay. And then finally, we have something called mixed land use. So mixed land use is this idea of combining residential, business, and entertainment buildings all in one area. What this does is gives people a sense of place. So they can live very close to where they work. 
very close to where they go to restaurants and go to concerts and sports games. And so all of this can just make a community feel more attractive to someone. It can make people want to stay in the city rather than move out into the suburbs. So our suggested science skill for practice of our QU 5.10 today is describing advantages, disadvantages, or unintended consequences of a solution. So I want you to describe a possible solution to the issue of urban sprawl, but then identify one possible economic consequence of this solution. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future APES video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar. <laughs>